Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Noka here from ProTech. Really appreciate you. Well, good morning to some of you, I guess, that are west of where I sit in the eastern time zone. Thank you very much for coming. I am, for purposes of today, Rod's wingman. And what that means is I'll be handling questions. So people, we've got a bunch of people signed up. There's going to be more coming in as we uh, get rolling, I'm sure. If you could, uh, as you develop questions, anytime you develop questions, type them into the question area. And what we're going to do is we're going to have specific stops at 20 after the hour and 40 after the hour. We have a planned webinar that should take 60 minutes. Rod and I are committed to stay until the last question is answered in case it goes beyond that. In the meantime, Rod Davison is your presenter for today. Rod has trained professionally as a theoretical mathematician, a psychologist, and an anthropologist. He, has, uh, he started doing research in AI in 1978, which goes back such a long way. To be honest with you, I thought, I wonder if it makes him a pioneer. AI, the AI question actually surfaced in the 50s, based on my extensive Google research this morning. Rod has managed and led AI research projects in machine translation, natural language procession, knowledge representation, and in expert systems. He's been continuously involved in AI research from that time in 78 when he began up until today. So with that, again, and with our thanks, I turn the presentation over to Rod Davison. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Tim. Greetings to everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may happen to be on the face of the earth. This is a uh, presentation that I have a lot of, say, personal interest invested in. And the reason for it is that AI is a particular passion of mine. And it's gone through cycles. And one of the things that I want to try and do in this class, in this uh, particular session, is to demystify a lot of the hype that's around AI, but at the same time emphasize what's really going on in AI that tends to get overlooked a lot because people are blinded by the hype. And my feelings about how AI is being perceived right now by the larger society and by the developer community is a little bit mixed. I'm glad that it's getting a lot of attention, but I think some of the attention is sort of addressed to the wrong place. It's, we're looking at the wrong things and missing an awful lot of interesting opportunities and trends, which is why in this presentation, what I've kind of structured it as tentatively, and I'll kind of be keeping to this kind of main topic point, is to say, first of all, uh, what's the future of AI? Uh, that's a question that's very important from a number of perspectives. From a technological perspective, uh, if you're somebody in a technology-based career, you want to know where these technologies are going, what's ahead. Uh, there's lots of different pred predictions, but also there is a lot of concern about the future of AI from a funding point of view, from a research point of view. And uh, we want to take a look at some of the factors that that uh, uh, are involved in in molding the future of AI. We also want to clarify exactly what AI is, because AI has been misrepresented by often well-meaning people, particularly in fictionalized accounts in media, movies. Remember the movie AI or, or the Terminator and all of these things present ideas of AI which actually seem to capture the, the public in, in a way that they think that's what AI is about. And they're missing a lot of the AI that's around them all of the time that is producing the very significant benefits. And so we want to try to focus on what exactly AI is and how AI actually works in terms of, of developing solutions, products, and that sort of thing. The other thing we want to take a look at is what's in the immediate near future for AI. Where is AI going to have its its renaissance? Where is this going to make its great great predictions? What are we not going to be able to do in the near future? And then what are the longer term trends in AI? What is AI going to be able to do based on what we're kind of, it's emerging now in technology and other areas. And then a very important point we often have to take into consider in AI, and, and this is something that, that we've learned from past experience, we have to think about AI in the marketplace and society. It's not just technology, it's also about people using technology and people funding technology. So that's what we want to take a look at. I will try to also be available to, uh, I've, I've had to keep this at a fairly high level. So if there are things that I'm not going to talk about in here or that I don't talk about that you want to, to uh, ask questions about, please feel free. Do not feel that you have to confine your questions to the specific, top, the specific topics at hand. Now, with apologies to Game of Thrones, there is something out there that, that, that I hear a lot now 
particularly by by people in the marketplace uh, saying winter the ai winter is coming and what we mean by an ai winter is the fact that ai funding interest and research is cyclical as tim mentioned ai started back in the 1950s with some really interesting ideas and it kind of faltered as we got into the 60s and 70s because while theoretically these ideas were fantastic and they were innovative and and real breakthrough thinking we just didn't have the computing power to be able to actually turn them into something that worked and speak, uh, for example they, when i was started off with with uh, doing some ai work i was working on a mainframe and i was given 24k of memory and a sliver of disk space in which to build something well, you just can't build something with that and not only that with a, a with a, a processor that's that speed was measured in megahertz you you just couldn't get it to work in in that particular environment so a lot of the the idea of moving ai into into the practical realm kind of got shelved and we went through the what we call the first ai winter and then as the microprocessor revolution and moore's law kicked into effect and we got more and more power into our computing environment, we saw a renaissance, a reemergence, a, 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 and a second boom in AI. And this is the one that I kind of rode through. We started looking at specialized hardware and systems that were not actually capable for us to start building actually computational and, and working models. However, that went into a boom as well, because even though the comp computing power was, was there as compared to the previous boom, it still wasn't enough. For example, the, the specific AI computer that I used was a, a LMI Lisp Symbolics type computer. It cost $300,000, obviously so it had to be funded by the government. And it had a full 16, uh, no, I think it was 26K of memory and a 200 megabyte disk drive, which uh, cost $60,000 and weighed about 150 pounds. Even that, we were pushing the limits of what we could do. But the one thing that really sunk us then is we overpromised. We started talking about what we could deliver, speech recognition systems, uh, systems that would read text into automatic translation. But the more that we tried to build the system, the more we realized we underestimated the complexity of the problems. And a lot of the times we weren't able to deliver systems because we did not understand the problem domain well enough. Well, of course, the people who were giving us all this money said, well, if you can't produce a product, then basically we're cutting the funding off. So I went into the, to the boom and I, I wound up getting work by basically carefully editing the words artificial intelligence out of my resume in order to, to continue to, to get work because people would look at your resume and say, artificial intelligence, oh dear God, you're not one of those are you so you had to kind of be careful and then what happened was we got another increase in computing power and we seen the, the the third artificial intelligence boom which we're in right now and the question is what's going to happen are we going into another winter and there's a couple of 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 different schools of thought here some people are saying no 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 we've reached the point where ai and they, we, people often throw out the term singularity here uh we've become we've gotten so good at ai and it's become it was so powerful that that there's no turning back other people say well you know it, it sounds good but it's gonna kind of deliver yeah you know some stuff and we're going to be able to do it so some applications will work but other stuff you know it's just you know basically what happened before. And the other one said, no, there's going to be a real backlash against AI because of its failure to deliver and a number of other factors, including a social rejection, regulatory issues and other things. And AI is just going to vanish and we're going to go into another winter. Well, the interesting thing about this is all of these are potentially correct. There's so many variables here that it's really difficult to predict, but we can not identify some of the factors that are going to influence what happens with AI over the next little while. But the first thing we have to do is really say, well, what is AI? And if you ask a lot of people what AI is, they don't know. They just said, oh, it's, it's kind of like robots and self-driving cars and, and supercomputers. Well, it, it's actually, this is a, the classification that we, we've traditionally used. This came out of Horvig and others who are, are kind of giants in the field, the pioneers in AI. And they say, really, when we're looking at AI, we're looking at four kind of different themes. Now, I've got them look like they separated very discreetly and crisply here, but, but they're fuzzy. They kind of overlap with each other. But the kind of work we'd, we've done in AI traditionally has been focused on try to, number one, in the left-hand corner, top left-hand corner, look for systems that think like humans. In other words, we want to emulate human thought processes. We want to have systems that basically have human type of brains. They can pass a generalized Turing test, which basically says if you're interacting with it, you shouldn't be able to tell 
based on the interaction, whether you're dealing with a person or a machine. These are the kinds of things that, are, that capture the, the popular attention, you know, synthetic people and cyborgs and super robots that, you know, take over the world and Terminator and all of these kinds of things. It's also into this category fall things like uh, autonomous systems and robots that can kind of adapt and solve problems and creativity and generate ideas. So that, that's, that's one area of research. And, and this has actually become, become very well codified in something we call cognitive science, understanding mechanisms. And this, while we don't actually build anything in this area, this is the area that produces the seeds that germinate into actual AI products. The other dimension on the human side is systems that act like humans. And this is what a lot of people think we're doing is we're gonna have artificial intelligence systems that basically are like robot companions and self-driving cars. And, and we're going to be able to converse and, and have relationships, uh, a lot of different sort of odd ideas. And you can see that represented in various kinds of movies and fiction. It's an interesting idea, it'd be really cool, but unfortunately, it's still something that, that we don't produce any actual products on that work, but it's still a very fruitful area of research that gives us seeds for the stuff on the right-hand side, which is, number one, systems that reason rationally. Now, by reasoning rationally, we mean that these don't think like humans, but what they do is employ some kind of reasoning mechanism that allows them to come to the right solution or the optimal solution to problems. And this is where we're seeing a really big boom in artificial intelligence. And this encompasses things like machine learning, expert systems, uh, large scale data analysis and modeling, data mining falls under here, predictive analytics, pattern recognition for image recognition. That's one of the big major areas here, speech recognition, computer vision. A lot of the different areas where we're basically offloading human cognitive tasks onto a machine that may do it completely differently, but still produces results that work for us. The, ra the, the systems that act rationally are things that do jobs effectively. And this side of the equation is often called bicycles for the brain, which means that just like a bicycle leverages your muscular capabilities, these systems leverage your reasoning and, and task management capabilities. So these are things like machine human interfaces, industrial and commercial robots, where we're automating mechanical work, task automation, where you're driving a car and there's a lot of artificial intelligence in the car in terms of collision avoidance systems, GPS, that are taking over tasks that you used to do. So you can focus on other more interesting things like having a conversation with the person next to you or something. We also look at monitoring and control systems which are very important you know, in terms of also things like predicting potential failures and, and people who are involved in, in maintaining and controlling systems to be able to focus their attention on critical areas rather than areas that are, are safe and, and not, and not uh, potentially uh, damaged. Also, we will have things that give us guidance in what we call task performance and things fall under this area like business intelligence, decision support, and being able to do very intelligent kinds of queries on data. So this is kind of the, the, the idea of what artificial intelligence is. And so on the left, those two things we can call artificial general intelligence, and that's generally a term that's often used. And this is talking about building human-like capabilities into an autonomous technical system like a computer car robot. And this is technology-centered in the sense we're taking the person right out of the equation and plugging some artificial autonomous system into the equation. And that is generally what most people think we're trying to do in AI. And we're gonna see in this class that that's not what we're trying to do at all because we understand the complexity of the problem. Instead, what happens is the, we also have on the right side this intelligence and performance augmentation. And this is really where we're seeing AI prove its worth, prove its value, and produce very, very positive benefits, both economically and socially, where we're enhancing the capacity of people to approach complex problems or difficult tasks to help solve them problems or derive solutions and accomplish the task. The picture, by the way, there down, at the, and this is human-centered. We're not taking the person out of the equation. What we're doing is offering AI tools to make the person's performance better. Now, the, the, the person in the picture there is named Sarah, and she is a paraplegic who is using a brain-machine interface to actually be able to power 
and control a, a robotic exoskeleton so that you can able to walk. And this is one of the, just an example of one of the areas of what we call the intelligence performance. AI is being used to help design things like these exoskeletons, which are helping people who are quadriplegic and paraplegic uh, be able to, to walk and, and maneuver. We're not, we're not curing them of it, but we're enhancing their abilities. Similarly, people who are we're using the, the same idea of uh, with people who are blind and deaf, we're able to provide augmentation to restore vision and hearing. That's the kind of thing that AI is really excelling at right now. So why do we still have these two areas? Well, the idea is that we've kind of gotten away from the idea of human over the last couple of decades, and we start to think about artificial intelligence as being uh, studying naturally occurring intelligence no matter where it is, not just human. So we understand the idea or the basic premise is that nature has solved a lot of problems by evolution that are similar to the kind of problems we're trying to solve. But nature's already been doing this for a couple billion years. And not only that, but most of the solutions that don't work have died out. So what artificial intelligence now does from an inspirational point of view, or, or like I said, the kind of stuff we focus on is saying, how does nature solve problems? What's the intelligence displayed in nature? And what can we learn from that to develop solutions to problems that we're currently facing? I mean, why reinvent the wheel? And this is often called biotechnology or bioneering. And the idea is to, is to copy or emulate. Now, those of you, uh, uh, patterns, uh, uh, patterns of solution that exist in, in nature. Now, those of you who are, are programmers, object-oriented programmers, know this is, this is a concept called design patterns. Uh, we look at patterns of solution. So, for example, people used to st uh, study an area called artificial life, which looks at how bees swarm and how fish school and how birds flock. And everybody said, what's the point of that? I mean, are you going to build artificial birds? Why would you build an artificial bird? I say, no, no, but we understand how things move. Autonomous entities can move in a swarm now. And we can use those insights to build things like this thousand uh, swarm of mini robots, which has incredible great applications. Uh, I'm not exactly clear on, on where they're using it, but I've, I've, I've followed them. And so they've got this thing called Kilobots, which I think came out, comes out of Harvard. Now, this, by the way, this is disturbingly enough to me look like Killbots so that I sometimes take a second look. But the idea here is that we learn. I'll just do one example of this. And this is this is a very classic example that you'll find. And this is the slime mold. The slime mold is a very primitive organism, but it's really, really good at solving routing and networking problems. And the reason for that is that the slime mold loves, if you have food sources like oatmeal, loves oatmeal, uh, it, it'll actually extend kind of these uh, kind of pseudopods out and, and create a network that connects food sources. So what the engineers in Tokyo did, uh, subway engineers, is they put out food sources that were a map of the various Tokyo subway stations and they let the slime mold connect them. And you can see on the left, there's the slime mold version of the Tokyo subway system. And on the right is the Tokyo actual version. When they looked and compared the efficiency of the two versions, the slime mold version was more efficient. Okay, so now people at that point say, well, so you're going to make slime molds design subways. No, but what we can do is look at the differences. And the, the engineers did this and discovered that they could optimize and improve the techniques they used and make them even more efficient by looking at what the slime mold did. In other words, they emulated some of what the slime mold did to create a better way of planning out subway systems. And this is a, a fairly famous thing. Now, we're looking at a similar situation now. Recently, it's been discovered that, that plants have this mycelium network, which is, uh, which is a fungus network. Uh, mycelium are basically long tendrils and threads of, of fungus. Uh, mushrooms are kind of the flower of, of this network. And there's thousands of miles of this mycelium network in all the plots of land, like a, like a couple hundred, you know, like if you take like an acre, there's, there's, there's ten, probably tens of thousands of miles of this network. And we've discovered that this network is what plants use to communicate, share information, nutrition, and other things. And in fact, the botanists call it the wood wide web. 
which I think is kind of corny. But what we're looking at here is trees actually position themselves in, in growing positions. They warn each other of predators, like uh, beetles and that kind of thing. And, and, they, and trees on the other side of the grove that are connected to them will develop pesticides or, or some kind of substance that will kind of repel the invader. Now, the interesting thing for this is that what we're seeing here is a naturally occurring internet of things. So as we're starting to move into figuring out how an internet of things should work, what we're looking at from artificial intelligence is to say, how did nature develop this internet of things? Because these things are not the same. Trees, bushes, shrubs, mycelium are not all the same thing. So how does this network of things work together? And we, we're not going to build one, but what we will do is give us insights into how these kinds of things work. Hey, okay, Rod. short term. Yes, go ahead. For everybody that came a little bit after kickoff, we uh, promised that we were going to start, I'm um, sorry, stop at 20 after and 40 after the hour for questions. And I do have a couple. It's okay go. to go, Rod? Go for, go for it. What is the greatest challenge to AI in terms of public and market acceptance, or is there one? Right now, it is. there's actually two, and I kind of mentioned them a little bit earlier. The first one is that people have a misunderstanding of what AI can deliver and they're expecting things that AI has never really promised for, and AI actually knows it can't deliver. So this is overhyping. A perfect example is Tesla's uh, autonomous cars. People have been basically thinking we're going to have these cars that will just drive around wherever they, uh, 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 and that's not, that's not going to happen for a variety of reasons. That's an undeliverable, that's an undeliverable product. That's the first one. The second one is that people, because they associate that with AI, they're not seeing what AI is really doing. So, for example, recommendation systems at Google, nobody really knows. When you go and, and uh, uh, sorry, Amazon, you buy something at Amazon, it recommends other things that you might be interested in. Nobody really knows that's an AI system there because it, it's, it's working so seamlessly in the background. So I think that's the biggest barrier is the misperception of what AI is doing. Assumptions it can do a lot of things that it never really claimed it was going to do and also not understanding what AI is actually doing, like Sarah and being able to walk because of, uh, because of an AI interface. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I'm going to give you the second one, and I think you've already covered it, but I want to respect the, uh, the right. questioner. So I'm going to give you this, and as I do, a reminder to all of our attendees to the webinar, any questions that you might have, throw them into the question area. We will take another break again at 40 after the hour and make sure they're all wrapped up before we end the webinar. Second question, what are the areas of AI that are being overhyped or underhyped? The areas that are being overhyped are basically what was on the left side of that screen. And, and two things I see overhyped a lot now are this notion of autonomous agents like, like uh, cars and robots that are be, going to be able to go out and, and interact with the environment in a, an adaptive way. These sorts of agents only can operate effectively often in very highly controlled environments like robots can work very well in a factory environment where the environment is known and they don't have to adapt to brand new situations, whereas out in the real world, they can't do that. And uh, I'm sorry, can we repeat the question again? What okay. are the areas of AI that are being overhyped or oh, okay, good. Thank you. Yep. The things that are being underhyped are where AI is providing that really, really valuable ability to solve problems in other areas that are, have been preventing breakthrough solutions like the human machine interface, where we're, we're seeing medical advances because AI is able to fill the gaps in on problems which were considered to be unsolvable or insurmountable in the past. And that's underhyped. And that's, that's, that's really where we're seeing a lot of the value of AI. So overhyped in terms of producing autonomous solutions, like we're going to get rid of loans officers and put expert systems in their place and it's going to make loan decisions. That's overhyped because that's not, and that's not going to happen. People are going to be disappointed. Underhyped, uh, man-machine interfaces, the ability to be able to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to work with, with data, for example, uh, fraud detection and other kinds of things. So it's the AI in the background that's being underhyped. All right. Excellent. Go ahead and roll okay. on. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Short-term trends. Okay. And as, as we can see, short-term trends are always difficult to, to work with in trending in any analysis. You know, extrapolation is, is always a tricky business. So I'm not going to commit myself to either one, any specific outcome. We'll look at some of the things that affect. Uh, that we're going to look at. And I've just explained one of the things that we are going to see here is we're not is is that the where we're going to the short-term trends are all on the right-hand side. 
This is where all of these things are going to continue to emerge over the next period of time. We're, the, the reasoning systems, machine learning, we're going to find better machine learning, expert systems. These things are going to continue to improve. Now, in the role of supporting actors, and they're not going to replace people, but they're going to make people much more effective in uh, making decisions and, and analyzing situations, crisis response, and that sort of thing. We're also going to see an awful lot more automation of things that that are going to enable people to do more than they could before, whether it's in transportation like in aircraft or it's going to be in uh, analyzing networks to produce more effective distribution of goods and being able to route things effectively uh, automatically. Those are the kinds of things we're going to we're going to really, really see explode. And I, I personally think if, if, if we continue on the way we're going, that that area is going to explode. However, we're while we still need to do a lot of research on the left-hand side in order to, to help us on the right-hand side, we're not going to see the, the kind of products coming out of the left-hand side. We're not going to see autonomous systems coming out. I'll just give you a very quick example of how this mechanism actually works with autonomous systems here. Uh, one of the things you'll often hear is people talking about the singularity. Uh, this is just an example, one example to try to illustrate this point. The singularity is, is, is where artificial intelligence becomes more intelligent than we are, and people start talking about the ability to download their consciousness into an artificial intelligence and live forever. Okay, well, basically, that is just not even possible in any, by any stretch of the imagination. And in this little scenario I'm going to describe for you know, kind of describes what goes on in AI and how we move from the, from the left-hand side to the right. So uh, back in the 50s and 60s, we realized that neurons were the atoms of thought. Somehow neurons were involved in thinking. So artificial intelligence says, ah, how do neurons think? And I said, well, neurons don't think. They're just like little individual atoms. So where does thinking come from? Well, it must come from how neurons are connected together because if, and, and experimentally we can show that if we disrupt these, these, these networks that we disrupt cognition. So therefore, if we want to develop artificial intelligence, what we're going to do is emulate or do something that looks like a, a, a network of neurons. And out of that came the idea of a neural net. Now, this is not an artificial neuron. This is a problem-solving technique that is based on trying to emulate the architecture of a neuronal network in order to create solutions to problems. Okay, so this, this is what we, you know, we call a, a neural net. Okay, now what happens is that neural nets have become incredibly powerful as a problem-solving tool in AI. So what we're calling deep learning is neural nets 2.0. And, we're some, and actually, it's neural nets 3.0. The original neural nets came up in the first AI boom in the 50s and 60s. The second version of neural nets came up in the, in the 70s and 80s. This is the third version of neural nets called deep learning. And just a couple of, there's a couple of examples here from the Stanford, uh, one of the Stanford deep learning studies that, that show that the ability to use trainable neural nets enables us to solve a lot of things. And of course, one of the big problems that really helped us solve was the idea of image recognition. Of course, it's not perfect. And I've kind of misrepresented this here. It looks like it's a 50-50 success and failure. It's actually more about a 90-10. And so you can see that pictures along the top, the sentence was actually generated by the neural net or, uh, or the, the AI. And they're all pretty good. But down at the bottom, you'll notice a young boy holding a baseball bat, cat sitting on a couch with a remote control. I don't know, it could be a cat a woman with a teddy bear in front of a mirror, and the other one is a horse standing in the middle of the road. Uh, obviously, big misses, all right? But still, it's got a pretty impressive uh, success rate. So that's really, really good. So the question is, that's an example of how we, we looked at something from on the left side, trying to emulate, look at how do people think and develop something on the right-hand side that was a very, very powerful tool. Well, so why can't we download somebody into the brain uh, or conscious into the brain? Because we've discovered we underestimated the complexity of how people think. And recently we've been really understanding these things called microtubules, which are really little tiny tubules that run through every cell. At a, at, 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 and everybody thought, well, they must be a nutrition factor or something down on the left-hand side there. You see the microtubules in the neuron. But we're starting to understand now that these microtubules seem to be basically involved in cognition at a fundamental level. And the reason we're saying that is because when these microtubules are damaged or unravel, uh, that's characteristic of things like Alzheimer's and dementia. Somehow, and we have no idea really how, 
we're suddenly discovering that cognition is taking place at a really, really low level or probably at a low level. And now scientists are looking at the notion of this concept of consciousness may in fact refer to some effects that are taking place at the microtubule level. And so therefore, if you tried to download your consciousness into a neural network, you'd be dead because we don't actually have the actual physical mechanisms of consciousness. This is going to be years of research before we really even understand what's going on here. That's why we're not going to build a brain from scratch because we just don't know how intelligence works. A couple of different examples here of how intelligence works. Uh, social intelligence, you got some people who are intuitively smart. We don't understand these mechanisms. How do people come up with ideas? You've all experienced at some point, you've worked on a problem and worked on a problem and you give up, you can't find a solution and go away and you're sitting there having dinner with your family and suddenly the whole solution pops into your mind fully formed. Well, that's a common occurrence. How does that happen? We don't know. Uh, we're starting to get some insights into it, but obviously we can't develop something that thinks like a human because we don't really know how humans think. And it's not just humans. There's Coco the gorilla also there. Coco the gorilla has demonstrated the capacity for abstract thought, learning, and a lot of the things that we assumed were, we're used to assume were, were human characteristics. We also discovers birds, elephants are also capable of many of the cognitive skills and tasks that we used to think were human, which tends, to, tends to us to think there are general principles of intelligence that are shared across different species and biologies. And of course, one of the big mysteries, which is absolutely fascinating, is the notion of the autistic savant, which as you can see from the Rain Man movie, you have these people who are functionally unable to cope with day-to-day -day living, sometimes needing assistance to dress themselves, are incapable of functioning in the world, but yet they're capable of incredible feats of mathematics, music, and art, which absolutely blow people's minds. Um, so and we don't understand how does that work? How, how does that mechanism fit into our, our models of how people think? So as you can tell, there's an awful lot of research that we need to do to really figure out what it is that when we're saying we're going to emulate human thought, well, what exactly does that mean? But by the way, but, but you will notice that what we are learning is helping us to build AI products. Uh, so the research is producing benefits. So what about things that interact? Uh, are we going to see systems that interact like humans in the near future? Well, that hasn't worked out so well. This is an example of Tay. Tay is a chat box, a chat, uh, sorry, a chat bot that uh, Microsoft put on the, the, uh, the uh, Twitter, and it was going to learn to interact with people through a learning mechanism, through a learning algorithm. And within 16 hours, it became a racist, anti-Semitic, and misogynistic fascist. Um, in other words, it was like somebody with absolutely no limits. You know, or, or as we often say, people have no filters, they have no limits, they have no concept of right or wrong, and they have no common sense. I've posted perhaps the most inoffensive of Tay's tweets, in which she supports genocide. The rest of it is so obscene and so brutally offensive that I can't even post, <laughs> post it in this presentation, and you can take a look at it. So Tay Talks, that was kind of, well, that didn't work out so well. And what we started to understand is that it, it, one of the big challenges we're faced with with making things that act like humans is that people get creeped out by things that act like humans. And this has been a, a document of something called the Uncanny Valley, where as we get things that are more and more human-like, it reaches a certain point in which we're no longer feeling nice towards it or thinking it's cute or it's nice, like C-3PO is up here as a humanoid robot. But then some of the really human-like robots basically give us really down here, like zombie level, it just creeps us out. We don't want anything to do with it. Now, a lot, there's been a lot of speculation as to why I believe the answer is quite simple, is that when something is so human-like, that it can easily be mistaken for a human, we start to expect it to act like humans. Because these things don't act like humans, we start to say, well, if that was a person and they were doing that, it would just be creepy. They would just, ooh, there's something wrong with that person. And we automatically and intuitively make that judgment about the system. And so things that are really, really human-like, but not perfectly human, just creep us out the same way that defective people would creep us out. And we saw this in when people used to have these systems that you would call into a, a utility and they'd say, hi, my name is Bob. What would you like to do today? And you say, I want to have an unusual charge in my bill. Oh, you would like to change your credit card. No, no, I have an unusual charge in my bill. Okay, you want to buy a new service. No, I want, and people would, this thing would be like totally, uh, you know, it, it was like it was dip, 
deliberately trying to annoy you and uh, 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 put you in a rage. I used to ask people in classrooms. I'd say, how many people have talked to these systems? Hands would go up. i say, how many people have, have yelled at it? Hands stay up. How many people have cursed at it? Hands stay up. How many people have yelled and cursed at it at the same time? All the hands stay up. i say, how many of you do that with normal people? All the hands go down. And I asked why. And generally the answer I got was because if that was a person, it would be doing their best to annoy me. And that's exactly what it is because it sounded so much like a person that people started saying, started attributing human motivations to it. And so it basically was assessed as just being a really annoying person. And that's one of the problems we have is that we don't understand enough about social interactions. Well, how can't, why can't we go in and start replacing things like there's challenges, out, uh, not challenges, but there's uh, proposals out there to, to do a recidivism, for example, analysis in prison systems where basically artificial intelligence will decide whether or not prison sentences based on somebody's likelihood to, to uh, re reoffend. And we've discovered that's completely racist. And the reason is because it was trained with racist data. And the problem is, is that just like we saw Tay didn't have any limits when it came to social interaction or no common sense, these systems we've got, like the ones we looked at earlier with the image recognition, don't have any common sense. And that's something that, that jumps out at us when we look at them. So this wolf classifier kept classifying certain dogs as wolves. And when the, they, they dumped out the, the kind of, had the, the system dump out the rationale for deciding this was a wolf, it basically said based on the background. And the, the, it said they realized that all of the, the, the images that had seen of wolves were in the winter with, with snow in the background. All of the images with dogs had grass in the background. So the AI basically generalized to the fact if there's snow in the background, it's a wolf. If there's grass in the background, it's a dog. To you, that is totally nonsensical it lacks common sense. And there's the problem. If we start having these decision-making mechanisms in places that make decisions, a lot of the decisions are going to be nonsensical. Remember, it doesn't think like a human, so we're, it's, it's, it's gonna create these kinds of errors. And I'll just close off, I know Tim, we're getting close to a question, I'll just go over this example. And we're seeing it right now being played out in real time. And the social cost of this to Tumblr is that people are just basically thinking of Tumblr as being kind of like a laughing stock. And Tumblr has basically said no adult content after December 17th. And so they've implemented an image recognition system which is gonna classify images and pull out all of the offensive adult-oriented sexual images. And so far it's been pulling out things like mechanical bunnies, Halloween chocolate, snow tires, and Joe Biden as being sexually oriented images. Uh, now, this is probably a very small percentage, but here's one of the problems is that because they're actually doing it and people are responding, they're starting to become a real backlash and people are looking and saying, well, these algorithms obviously don't work. Well, maybe they work pretty well, but there's the problem because now when people are looking at the mistakes, they're saying these mistakes are nonsensical. There's no possible way that you could interpret this because they're applying human judgment standards to these kinds of things. All right. So. Are we actually getting successes? Absolutely. Once we get away from this kind of autonomous stuff of, of having these things make decisions on their own, and when we see them in decision support, by the way, this is what comes from the Julia Computing website, so that's where you can see references to Julia in here. So this is an example of an Australian, uh, this is a decision support, where the Australian power grid is being monitored uh, through uh, radar and, and uh, photographs over a very wide ranging area, and they're using machine learning to identify areas that they need to pay attention to or potential failures or a risk of failure. What this does is leverage the ability of people to maintain that, that network, that electrical grid, and save them time and eliminate a lot of the tedious tasks like looking through thousands of photographs to try to figure out where things are. Are they gonna miss something? They might, but they're, they're still leveraging and improving the ability of people to, to do the electrical grid. Similarly, to genetic diversity, just sorting through all the genetic data that we've got from genomic data from various kinds of studies is a tedious, time-consuming process. But if you can use image matching and pattern recognition, uh, you can speed up that whole process with other kinds of machine learning to improve the ability of biologists and, and other people to work in areas involving genetic analysis, diversity, and a whole bunch of other kind of similar related medical research areas. The Financial Crimes Enforcement Network in the United States is, is up against a very interesting battle, whereas they're trying to identify money laundering and uh, of course people are trying to hide money laundering and so it's not immediately obvious what the patterns of money laundering are because people are trying to conceal it but using machine learning they're actually able 
to find patterns out of that that are normally hidden and use those as leads into investigations into money laundering and that sort of thing. And similarly, deep learning for medical diagnosis. Here's an example in India where uh, it, it was a very tedious process to try and and identify a diabetic retinopathy in in uh, in the 62 million diabetics in India because it, it, it involves a lot of expert analysis. But what they were able to do is to develop machine learning techniques that allow them to take pictures and to start to, to have a lot of people analyze pictures with uh, in, in a much more efficient and effective way. So now, instead of having experts going through a tedious analysis, they can basically use a low-cost camera, a technician, machine learning system, and they're improving their ability to be able to do di diagnosis and prediction. So, so, th so these are areas where AI, so it may not classify wolves very well, you know, it may, it may not talk too well on the internet, with, with, with tweeting on Twitter, but boy, is it ever producing significant results in the application area of doing various kinds of support. Okay, Tim, I'll just do these slides and then you can go to questions. So what's missing in the short term? We still don't know enough about human cognition and interaction to create autonomous systems. In fact, some of the things people are suggesting now, we'd have to grow AI. We're not going to be able to build an AI that acts like a person. And the mistakes we're looked at are characterized by something called lack of reasonableness or common sense. In other words, we seem to be missing something along the line. Autonomous AI acts the, uh, lacks the filters that we need, but in, the sh uh, in order to, to guide decision-making interaction. However, we are seeing that while the issues in the short term are too difficult to solve, we're seeing an explosion in the applied AI systems and technology, human machine interfaces, cybernetic enhancement, the ability to be able to process large amounts of data that we couldn't before for useful and usable information like FinCEN, automation of computational mechanical tasks uh, so we can focus on things that are more important, special purpose robots and robots that are autonomous in controlled environments like in a factory where we can control the environment, they can operate fairly autonomously in a factory as long as we don't change things around on them. Decision support expert systems, optimization tools for design products like we saw with the Tokyo subway. And we have considerable economic benefits. So what we're seeing is a probably a short-term boom in AI in these areas or, or a boom over the short term. I'm very, I'm very bullish on, on how these technologies are going to progress over the next period of time. Okay, Tim, questions? You got a few. All right. I'm going to give you. Uh, I'm going to give you the first one, and then I probably don't need to explain it for most people in the room. But I'd like to give a little background on it that I had to Google for my since okay. I'm not since I since this isn't my game. The question is: How do we prevent issues like Palantir AI sending police to places where there are the most arrests, et cetera? And the one or two lines of background that I just wanted to give, based on what I read, is they helped New Orleans police go to where gang members were. They did it through big data and AI, and it's introducing potential civil, civil liberties violations. So with that question and with that background, it's off to you, Rod. And I do have several more. Yeah, okay. The, the, the point where, where, and this is one of the concerns we have, and I'll t deal with this a bit later in the presentation, is that it is not the system itself that's the problem, but how it's being used in a social environment. And very often, like I said, there's a recidivism program that looks for sentencing, and it was trained on racist data, so it becomes racist. The other thing that we're looking at here is this: is that people are, are starting to use the predictive analysis of these things as proof of guilt or, or potential guilt. And we're, we're getting to a real problem with things like predictive policing. So there's a social component to this where people are saying look you know if you want to know where to allocate your resources these are fantastic tools so we know that gang members tend to be here at these particular times if you want to increase your policing in that area that's fine but then when you start arresting people because they fit a profile of somebody likely to occur you started to transgress the boundary of what's socially acceptable and this becomes an issue that has to be dealt with at the level of what are the extents to which we can use AI in the question? This is one of the things the challenges that AI has is that we have to understand is that the pushback against AI, the litigation, the social rejection of AI, the liabilities of AI have to be carefully concerned. And there has to be a corresponding emphasis on the 
training of people to use these AI tools in a way that's consistent with governance strategies, socially accepted norms, uh, uh, civil rights, and other kinds of things. So this is definitely a problem that has to be looked at and unfortunately is not being addressed to the extent that it should be at this particular point. This is one of the things that could cause a blowback on AI and, and contribute to kind of going into a bit of an AI winter. All right. I hope that answers the question. Okay, next. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, how can an organization driven by biz, business benefits get started on using the underhyped abilities of AI, et cetera? One of the first things you can do is start to look at where you invest your time and energy. What are the kinds of problems that you continually invest uh, resource capital in? Are there things that seem to be really labor intensive? Are there places where you're kind of doing the same thing over and over again? You're not, and, and it's very computationally effective, resource intensive. They're, they're basically, you have to start with an analysis of what are, what are we doing? So for example, routing strategies for somebody like FedEx. Are there ways that we can take the data that we've got and start to figure out at what point in our operations could we benefit from either an automation, benefit from rethinking our strategy, develop different algorithms? So the first thing you have to do is you gotta you gotta do a self assessment. It's like it's like going into going and developing a, a fitness program. First thing you gotta do is figure out where you need to change. Where can you get benefits? If you don't look at it from a what are potential benefits and do a real cost benefit analysis on introducing AI into components of the organization, then you could wind up just wasting a lot of money and not getting any benefits. Uh, the other thing that I would, I would strongly suggest is that people who are doing, trying to move into AI as part of their corporate infrastructure, work with very small pilot projects initially to kind of reduce the, the risk of AI not going the way that it should go. Uh, those are two things I would suggest. Number one, Analyze what you're doing, look for target candidates for where you could benefit from AI, research the AI, figure out what AI should go in there, and do a risk analysis. Use small projects and prototypes in order to, to ensure that, that uh, you've, you've mitigated any potential risks and things that you've overlooked. All right. Okay, I got two more. Since many people think AI is a big trend, many people are saying AI will take over their simple desk jobs and are worried about it. Well, in the past, we had most people were farmers and the Industrial Revolution hap happened and everything was fine. Then the Electrical Revolution and people were fine. The thing that I say to people all the time is, you know, we don't have any uh, milk men anymore, for example. Everyone still has jobs, although they are different. How should we explain to society that AI will not take over rapidly? It will be well-paced and humans will adapt, let alone when government puts a lot of regulations on AI. I would like to know your thoughts on this. Basically what happens is AI represents a class of things called disruptive technologies. These are things which change the marketplace and change society in, in, in ways that, that basically are transformative. The car was disruptive. A refrigeration was disruptive. The computer was disruptive. The internet was disruptive. One of the things we have to remember is that when disruptive technologies come in, although they eliminate things like milkmen and ice boxes and the Iceman, what they do is they open up whole new areas, opportunity. And one of the things we're seeing played out right now in the American Midwest is that this idea of manufacturing jobs. Manufacturing jobs have been a, a, a political uh, football. And uh, you've had some people saying, well, what we'll do is we'll just bring all the manufacturing jobs back. What we're really seeing though is manufacturing jobs didn't go anywhere geographically, they were automated. Now, what that means is that we may be looking at seg the segments of the marketplace uh, that are going to, uh, uh, or segments of the workforce that are going to become obsolete, but also going to open up other areas. And one of the things that I would recommend, and in particularly in, in terms of uh, people looking at policy, is that we're, we have to be looking at, at the idea of, of adapting the social structures, retraining programs, the concepts of, of, of work, uh, and, we're, and we're in a big change now as to how all of these kinds of things are going to impact. It's not just AI. There's a whole bunch of transformative technologies out there, which AI is just a part that's going to cause some fundamental changes. So I think from, uh, you can't go backwards. The changes have already happened. They're starting to be disruptive. And what we do to accommodate those, look forward and say, well, how do we ride this wave of innovation and what are the new areas that are coming up? If you told somebody in the 1960s you're going to be a web designer, they just look at you and go, you're an idiot. That, that doesn't even make sense. However, today, that's a, that's, a, that's a lot of people are web designers. So 
Uh, it's it's progress, but it, again, it has to be managed. Uh, Uber, a, a typical example, Uber disrupted the taxi industry. And yeah, a lot of taxi drivers, for example, lost the value of the medallions. But generally, the market was so powerful and moved on that uh, taxi drivers have to adapt or realize that, that that kind of model is going. And this is this is something, it's just one, AI is just part of this whole larger disruptive transformational uh, effect that technology has on society and has had for 100 years. You mentioned fraud detection earlier. Did you mean yep. payments fraud detection? If so, which technology skills would you say are required to gain AI expertise in payments fraud area? I would say that there's a couple of ones that are, that's a, oh, that's a great question, by the way, um, because this, this, by the way, will be a growth area. You want to start looking at a lot of the data technologies using big data, data mining, the various kinds of strategies used in data mining, because data mining looks for relationships that aren't immediately obvious. And that uh, data mining is kind of like a, an overlapping Siamese twin with machine learning. They're kind of you know, overlap quite a bit. Machine learning techniques, pattern recognition. So things like deep learning, convolutional neural nets, and these other sorts of things. I would say if you're interested in, in fraud detection uh, is to focus on the data mining, big data, data analytics, and uh, the machine learning techniques. Those are, are kind of the core technologies that we use for fraud detection because fraud detection is really about identifying subtle patterns in massive amounts of data. So you can flag patterns that are statistically anomalous as indicators of fraud or patterns that are that that you can identify that are characteristic of when somebody's committing a fraud. OK, excellent. I'm wrapped up, sir. All right. Good. Long term trends. It's really hard to do long term trends, but there are a couple of things I've mentioned twice that uh, or in two places, it was lack of computing power that really stalled us in a lot of what we could do. For example, we have no idea how we're ever going to develop any kind of technology to emulate those microtubules in, in brains. But there are some technologies that are coming along that are going to give us that capability. And I used to think, following this fairly carefully, that we would see this like this is 22nd, you know, 22nd century technology. Then I thought, well, we may not see for 10, 20 years. And now I'm thinking, okay, maybe five or six years, honestly. Quantum computing is is, is basically this idea of, of using quantum technology to compute. Uh, you probably heard about it. I used to think, based on my reading of the field, that quantum computers, we might see working quantum computers in the 2030s. But lo and behold, so many breakthroughs have taken place that uh, quantum computing is here now. And quantum computing basically is waiting on one thing, which apparently may have been done. I've, I've seen items on this. I'm trying to search is room temperature semiconductors. As soon as we get room temperature semiconductors, quantum com computing will become, go through a real boom. Quantum computing will literally revolutionize a lot of the things that we do in terms, is particularly in computing, particularly in machine learning, particularly in optimization, robotics, it's going to unleash an ability to do computational things that are that are going to jump out of our, our silicon-based processing environments, where really we're hitting quantum effects that are interrupting our processing at the silicon level. We're packing so many transistors on a chip, so to speak, that this is going to open up a whole new area of com computational power. Why aren't we doing computation? Why aren't we doing quantum computing? right now by the way that is a real quantum computer is because it's incredibly expensive and because it needs to be super cooled and requires massive amounts of funding quantum computers are incredibly expensive just like mainframes were in the 1950s but again as as we're able to develop engineering breakthroughs in quantum computing the price comes down that's going to open up a lot of doors for ai the other thing we're looking at is dna computing or biocomputing in which we're actually using DNA as a computational medium. And we've actually got DNA computers. There's a picture down there of the actual first DNA computer built in 2002. And DNA is an incredibly powerful computational mechanism. A one gram of DNA has got 2,200 terabytes of potential data storage. And Harvard, as you can see, has already crammed 700 terabytes into a single gram of data. And one pound of DNA contains more computing power than all the computers ever made. Incredibly energy efficient, currently very expensive. Same reason why we, we're not seeing DNA computing now is because these are very, very, very expensive. As the cost curves come down, it's going to open up incredible computing power. 
And that's the thing that's been hamstringing a lot of the stuff we're doing right now. The third long-term trend that we're seeing is raising AI's children to get around this notion of lack of reasonableness and common sense because we learn like uh, neural nets by adapting and extrapolating from new situations, semi-data, data, extracting patterns, but then we generalize those into rule-based systems that give us the common sense. And this seems to be through a process of trial and error and slow learning. It's not something we can program in. It seems to be something that has to emerge. As we used to say in cybernetics in the 1970s, you can't build a complex system from scratch. You have to build a bunch of simple systems that work and then connect them together and build up a complex system that way. So AI traditionally has gone one way or the other. We've got rule-based systems like Deep Blue, which are incapable of adapting to new situations. We've got things that are adapt, like neural nets that can adapt to new situations, but are incapable of developing common sense. If we can somehow kind of fuse those two and use the model of how human children learn, we're actually going to maybe be able to get around the challenge of autonomous systems not being able to function. So we're still not seeing autonomous systems. This is all research. We're still not likely to see autonomous systems. We still don't know, know enough about human cognition and interaction. These things are going to have to learn like children because we're not going to, we don't know enough to, to basically program it into them. We're going to have to grow autonomous systems, it appears. And the other problem we're coming into is science are saying, well, we need, we need consciousness. And we're not really too sure what that actually means, but it's starting to come up more and more. And so we're seeing that these kind of true AIs are decades away. We've got lots of stuff in the short term, but we have to wait for the longer term to see quantum computing, biocomputing, computing modes, this idea of growing AI systems. And, and so AI, but the interesting thing is AI itself is being used to actually build these kinds of models and technologies. I'm just going to close off with a couple of very quick comments. I only got a couple of minutes. Market trends. This is one of my concerns is that people are pumping a lot of money into AI. And I always get concerned when I see this because this is the revenue curve that they're expecting. And if this revenue curve starts to flatten out, we may look at a downturn in AI funding, which is a, which is a bit of a big concern. And that may start to bring a bit of an, a, a winter in. And we start to look at the amount of venture capital being pumped into, into AI. They're going to want return on investment. And again, if we don't start delivering on some of these things, we've got some real liabilities there in terms of continued funding in AI. So in the short term, the market, as we can see, we're seeing governments get in. We've seen the Chinese government starting to dump a lot of funding into AI. One of the reasons why governments are getting involved is China is looking at the fact that by using AI enhancement, of its marketplace, it can induce additional, induce a significant amount of growth into its gross value added. So there's motivations both in the public and private sector. And the question is, and I won't go through these, but you can see there's a lot of reasons why people uh, are, are adopting AI. And the question is, are AI actually gonna solve their problems or meet their needs? If not, uh, the market's going to become very, very negative towards future funding and investment in AI. So we've got to deliver. Okay, final couple of points is that we may see a social pushback against AI. So autonomous systems failure is a Google car that crashed. Google cars don't crash that often and accidents are very rare. But if we get a situation where Google car wipes out a bunch of school kids that are crossing and kills a few, you can't be sure that that is going to lead a chorus of banning or putting highly regulatory things on autonomous systems. And as a result, we have to be very careful about deploying autonomous systems that have that risk factor involved or this one, where we have a gentleman who was arrested twice based on facial recognition technology, and it wasn't the guy whose life was ruined, massive liabilities. These kinds of cases are, again, an example of a improperly deployed AI support system, which led to a really negative consequence. And as a result, what we tend to see, whoops, as a result, what we tend to see is if, if people make these kinds of mistakes in deploying and using AI, there's going to be a regulatory and social pushback. As somebody just mentioned on predictive policing, where it's used inappropriately, it's causing a social and regulatory pushback. Uh, I, I mentioned disruptive. That was what I had before. I'll just close off with this one comment. Government of China is putting one of their biggest social experiments. They're assigning everybody a social credit rating based on how good a person you are and basically monitors every aspect of your life. I'm watching this very carefully because I wanna see how people respond to the idea of ever having every aspect of the life monitored, assessed, and then graded, and then restrictions being placed on them based on a social credit score. And this is all being driven by artificial intelligence. You can't do this without AI. 
So what I'm basically going to summarize that by saying that that one of the social trends that AI has to be very careful about is misuse of AI into things, projects, and systems that are going to cause a pushback by the public in terms of of saying no, we don't want this. It's dangerous, and you're going to start seeing start seeing legislative governance and generally people socially saying nope, don't want that stuff. And the other problem we've got is if AI doesn't deliver in the short term in terms of applications that produce revenue, we may look at market funding driving up. So those are the two of the social and market trends that we really have to be careful of. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. All right. So, Tim, I'm now going to open for any other questions. I'll just say that I hope you found this uh, a little bit illuminating. I've tried to provide a perspective into artificial intelligence, which doesn't talk about what the next trendy thing is, but kind of the, the issues that, that we're going to, that are really going to kind of shape and move the field over the next little while in the short term and long term. So uh, thank you all very much for your kind attendance, and we'll open it up again to questions, Tim. Why are people scared of AI messing up like crashing? If you compare the stats, maybe an AI car will crash 5% of the time, while a human will be a much higher percentage. How can we get society to understand this? That's a, a problem we have with lots of technologies. For example, air traffic, air travel is one of the safest ways to travel compared to auto tra traffic. But yet people are more concerned about, about uh, air crashes than they are about car crashes. It, it, it's these dramatic few instances that catch people's imagination and attention. And we don't see... The, the, if they looked at the actual statistics, they would say, "Oh, okay, well, it's not that it's not that 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 dangerous a thing." It's like terrorism. And when you look at how many people die from tainted meat versus terrorism, you realize, or from infrastructure problems, you realize that the problem is not really terrorism, uh, because very few people actually die from terrorism, uh, certainly in the United States, uh, and, and uh, as opposed to things like tainted meat or, or bad water. But but it doesn't capture people's imagination. This is a problem we have in almost every area is that certain very dramatic, high profile examples that people relate to. Oh, what if that was me? What if I was the guy who got arrested by the, because of the facial recognition? And that captures the public imagination. And, and we run into this problem all of the time, almost in almost every area. It, it's just, it seems to be just part of human nature and AI's run smack up against it uh, again with 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 autonomous you know like as you point out uh the google car crashes are actually very few and far between but the ones that do happen make the headlines whereas you know the other kinds of crashes that people have don't because they're just so they don't they don't capture people's imagination it's just it's just something we, we we just have to have to acknowledge is going to happen and try to avoid the kinds of situations that that could capture the public's attention Okay, so we have no questions. I'll I'll take up the gap here with my own. One of the things that you have me thinking about with that is vaccinations. We've made those determinations in vaccinations that they are going to hurt some people, but because they've eradicated disease, that we're we're rolling forward, right? So this is uh, you know we've we've made those determinations in the past without a doubt, right? Yeah. Yeah, and this this is the point is that is that it's very when you look at the data on these things, very often the public perception is wildly skewed. You know, if you ask Americans, you know, they're, they're scared of dying in a terrorist attack, but the probability of that is le much much less than them being struck by lightning and you know three times in a row or something to that. And when you start to look at the odds, you start to realize where the real dangers are. But unfortunately, the public doesn't do that. There. You've got a couple cases of people who've had uh, bad reactions to vaccines. It does happen, but that is somehow in the public perception offsets all of the literally millions of lives that have been saved through vaccination. And uh, now we're starting to see outbreaks of, of chicken pox and things like that. And people are starting to realize, oh, well, maybe, you know, vaccinations might be a good thing. So unfortunately, this is just how public perception tends to work. Yeah, it takes time to grow into it. Yeah. We we got to chat enough that we've lost a lot of people and there's no new questions. I think it's time to call it to an end. So again, right. uh, to everybody that came and uh, especially to you, Rod, our host, thank you very, very much. That it was, was very interesting. Pleasure.